let's talk about floats. First float that we'll focus on is tables. You can create a table using two different environments. The tabular environment, which handles the structure and the content, and then the table environment, which handles the labeling and placement and other descriptive aspects of the table. So let's start with the following code using tabular. First thing we type is begin tabular. Then after the begin command we need another set of curly braces and this is where we're going to tell LaTeX how many columns are in our table. I'm going to type L C R. So I've got three letters there. That means I want three columns in the table. The L means that first column should be left justified. The C in the middle means the second column should be centered. And the R means the third column should be right justified. Now I'm going to skip down a few lines and type end tabular. Remember it's always a good idea to close your environment off that you've created after beginning it so you don't forget. Now in between these two commands are going to be the content of the table. Let's say I typed 1 ampersand 2 ampersand 3 and then two backslashes. This creates the first row of my table. The content of each cell is 1, 2, and 3. The ampersands separate columns. So continuing with that I could make the second row this way. The double backslash at the end signifies the end of a row. It's very important that however many columns you request here at the beginning with the tabular command are reflected in the actual table itself. We don't want to, for example, create an extra column like this. That will give an error. And there's another row, 789. When you're done, you just need the end tabular. If I click compile, you can see that this produces this output right here. Right now it doesn't look much like a table, but we can continue to add some commands to improve it. In particular, let's add the table environment. So above tabular, I'm going to type begin table and then after end tabular I'm going to type end table. Now I also want to add a few additional arguments inside that. After begin table I'm going to type begin center and then after end tabular, but before end table, I'm going to type end center. That's going to center the table. I'm also going to type the command caption. I'm going to type this right after begin center. And inside the curly braces with the caption command, I'm going to type a caption for the table. Now let's say I wanted some horizontal lines separating different rows in the table. There are a couple of ways to do this. One of them is to first add the book tabs package. And that gives you a command called top rule. And I'm going to specify an optional argument with top rule. I'm going to say 1.2 PT or 1.2 point. That's going to make a thick line at the top of the table right after the caption. Then right after end tabular I'm going to type 
bottom rule, 1.2 point, that'll do the same thing at the bottom. You can also type mid rule to put a thinner line inside the content of the table. Now, as it turns out, the book tabs commands actually work better when they're inside the tabular environment. So I'm going to switch that. So it says begin tabular, then top rule. And so that the bottom rule command comes before end tabular. When I compile that, here's the result. Here's the table caption, and notice that LaTeX automatically created a name, table one. Here's the top rule, it's a thicker line. The bottom rule is also a thicker line, and here's the mid rule, it's a thinner line. Another command that is helpful is the label command. And that usually goes right under caption. With the label command, you give the table that you just created some name. I'm calling mine example-table. It doesn't matter too much what this table is called, except you, you want to make the name descriptive of the content rather than the number of the table. So we don't want to call this table 1 for example. And here's why. If you wanted to refer to this particular table in the text of your document you could do the following. Here I've typed as you can see in table and then I've typed backslash ref and in curly braces the name of the label. See the example table here matches example table here. What this is going to do is fill in the number of this particular table automatically. Now to do this you actually have to compile LaTeX a few times. So I'm going to compile once and compile twice. After compiling twice what you can see says, as you can see in table one, right here. This is what I typed. The reason this is useful is because if you decide to move table the table around, move it earlier in the document or later in the document, and the order of all your tables changes, this text right here will update to the new table number. This is different from if you simply wrote table one directly like this then if you moved the table and it was no longer table 1 you'd have to change this manually but if we have the ref argument in there it will change automatically and one final point on tables is the multi column command Let's say I wanted some text to stretch across two or more columns. For example, let's say I wanted some text to stretch across the uh, cell that has 7 and the cell that has 8. Instead of just 7 ampersand 8, I could type multi-column. Then we're going to have three sets of curly braces. In the first set is the number of columns we want to stretch across. I'm going to type 2. The next set of curly braces is a letter, L, C, or R, depending on if we want the text left justified, centered, or right justified. I'm going to type C for centered. And then finally, the third set of curly braces is the actual text that we want to put in there. Notice that this is taking up two columns, and then I've got the third column represented by the number 9. So even though we're stretching across columns, we still need to have a total of three in this case, since we've told LaTeX up here that we want three columns in the table. And so when I compile that, what we see is text that stretches across those two columns.
Now let's talk about inserting figures into a document. Figures work a lot like tables. First, we want to make sure that we have the graphic X package. This is what's going to allow us to insert graphics into our document. Figures can be created with the figure environment. So I'm going to type begin figure, then leave a few lines and type end figure. And we're going to want our figure to be centered, so I'm going to type begin center and end center. Now, the, the actual figure we're going to be looking at today is this file, example figure one. It's a PDF file. We don't have to insert PDF files, but they work pretty well, so that's what we'll use. You can also do JPEGs or PNGs or several other types of files. Now, you need to have the figure file in the same folder as your tech file. That's very important because LaTeX is going to look in that folder to find the figure when inserting it. When we've got that, you can type backslash include graphics. Then we're going to do an optional argument in square brackets called scale. I'm going to set the scale to 0.5, and that's just reducing the figure size by 0.5 so it fits on the page. And then the name of the figure. And then finally we can include a caption. And we can also include a label, just like we did with the table. And when we compile that, here's what we see. Here's our figure, and here is the caption for the figure. We can use the backslash ref command, just like we did for tables, with figures. We can even include more than one graphic in a figure by typing the include graphics command multiple times. So for example, I have another PDF file called example figure two. And if we compile that, results in two figures rather than or two graphs rather than just one. And if you make them small enough, so for example if I take the size down just a little bit, the graphs will appear side by side. As we see here. You can even give separate captions to each graph in a figure like that. You need the subfig package for that. And then I've got some code that I'm going to copy here. Let's say I want to put example figure 3 and 4 together, each with their own caption. So notice that what I've done here is I've typed backslash subfloat then in square brackets the caption for this particular graphic and then put my entire include graphics command inside curly braces and I've done this twice for two different graphics and the result looks something like this so here is if we just use include graphics two times. Here's what we get if we use the subfloat command. We get a caption for this graph and a caption for this graph. Now let's talk about float placement. 
With the commands as we have right now, LaTeX simply tries to find what it thinks is the best place for each of these tables and figures. But let's say we wanted to change that in some way. There is a set of optional arguments that we can place in square brackets right next to the begin table command and also right next to the begin figure command. And we're going to put a letter inside these square brackets. If we type a lowercase h, that's telling LaTeX to put the figure or table here, which means right at that point in the document. LaTeX will try to do that, but sometimes it doesn't have enough room and so it has to go on to the next page, but it will try to place it here. You could also type T, that's for top of the next page, B, which is bottom of the page, and P, which is a page of floats at the end. Another option that's a little bit different is to use a separate package. So I'm going to go ahead and delete these optional arguments and instead I'm going to add the package end float. The end float package takes all of your floats, tables and figures, and puts them at the end of the document, each one on a separate page. It also places some text at the current point in the document where you actually made that float and says this is where that table or figure goes. So if you've got end float in your preamble and you compile the document, you can see what this looks like. So instead of actually placing the table here, it places some text that says table one about here, or in the case of the figures, it places figure one about here, figure two about here, and then at the end of the document, it provides a list of figures, and then the figures, each one on a separate page, and a list of tables, and a table, each one on a separate page. Now you can specify some optional arguments with end float. For example, we could say no lists, and that will take away those lists of tables and figures. You could also say figures first, which is the default. That'll make list the figures first. Or I could say tables first, and that'll place the tables first. So if I compile that, what we see is, first of all, our table comes first, and notice we have no list of tables or list of figures in the document. Okay, so those are the basics of floats. In the next video, we'll take a look at doing mathematical expressions in LaTeX.